Did you know that back in the mid-1960s, Janis Joplin had a chance to join the 13th floor elevators? Today, we're going to dissect this little-known piece of history. To get into the story, some context is needed. And for that, we must join Joplin on her first journey to the West Coast. Janice left Austin for San Francisco at the beginning of 1963, hitchhiking across the country and landing at Coffee and Confusion, which was a beatful coffee bar in North Beach. This spot was known for being a bit of an old-style non-stop hootenanny in which performers were both unpaid and also forbidden from soliciting donations from the audience. Joplin's performance here was so captivating that the proprietor broke his own rule and allowed a donation hat to be passed around. Even in her early days, she made waves. Compared to Texas, she was able to pretty much live without money, staying at a communal house, eating discarded food from local markets, or popping into a nearby church soup kitchen. The carefree nature of the area also meant that if you played music or sang, you were pretty much instantly accepted as part of the growing hippie community. While some of that existed in Austin, there was more of a proud freak flag in the Bay Area that just seemed more welcoming. But danger still lurked everywhere. After rejecting advances from a high-ranking member of the local folk scene, she was banned from the coffee gallery, which had become kind of her local regular haunt. Then, after leaving a lesbian bar, she was beaten up by a motorcycle gang. She did make some waves with record companies, most notably at her unbilled 1963 Monterey Folk Festival performance. But nothing really came of it. Through all of this, Janice was heading down a dark path, leaning into hard liquor and drug vices thanks to the encouragement from the local West Coast scene. In early 1965, she was so strung out and paranoid that she attempted to check herself into San Francisco General Hospital as a mental patient, but she was turned away. This led to using heroin to numb the pain of coming down from speed. Joplin's return to Texas in 65. By May of that year, she was pretty much at rope's end, returning to Port Arthur near the Gulf Coast, just to the east of Houston, to recover physically and mentally. She also returned to get married, which never really took place, and that's kind of a story for another time. She moved back in with her parents and attempted to go straight. While avoiding many she used to run with, she did maintain a few past relationships, one was a local Port Arthur columnist, Jim Langdon, who ultimately convinced her to sing at the Halfway House Coffee Bar in Beaumont, Texas. He penned a write-up in his Nightbeat column, which led to Joplin booking more small performances in the Houston and surrounding areas. Come mid-December, she was booked as a guest at a popular blues club in Austin called The Eleventh Door. And now we need to pivot to the elevators. The early days of the 13th floor elevators. Not long before Joplin was booked at the 11th door, the 13th floor elevators debuted at the Jade Room. The band had formed in 1965 with guitarist and vocalist Rocky Erickson at the helm. Erickson teamed up with electric jug player and lyricist Tommy Hall, whose unique instrument and visionary lyrics would ultimately become a defining feature of the band's sound. Though he may not have actually coined the term, Hall was really actually the first person to describe the unique style of music the elevators played as psychedelic rock. They were soon joined by Stacey Sutherland on guitar, Benny Thurman on bass, and John Ike Walton on drums. Released in early 1966, their debut single, You're Gonna Miss Me, caught on quick, gaining regional popularity. This single paved the way for their debut album, The Psychedelic Sounds of the 13th Floor Elevators, which was released later that year in 1966. The album also included tracks like Fire Engine and Reverberation, which showcased this new psychedelic rock thing. However, the band's open advocacy for drugs, and psychedelic drugs, and in particular LSD, led to increasing run-ins with the local law enforcement. And to no surprise, they'd get arrested that year for possession. 
they weren't alone in their exploration. Austin in 1966 was fast becoming a hub for something new happening in music and culture. Janice, the 13th floor elevators, St. John, the Conqueroo, the scene started bringing in different factions from within town, and there was this mashup of country and blues and folk and rock and R&B, all conversing and converging together. And this led to some very interesting collaborations. Rocky would meet Janice at a party, capturing the event in the line, I've seen your face before, I've known you all my life, which was featured in the song Splash One. The Big Ask. The pivotal moment came at a benefit concert for blues musician Theodore Jackson on March 12, 1966. This event, held at the Methodist Student Center, featured an impressive lineup including the 13th Floor Elevators, Janis Joplin, and quite a few others. The concert was notable not only for its blues focus, but also for Austin's first psychedelic light show, adding to the electric atmosphere. Janice, dressed in a severe black dress, delivered a powerful set of blues folk standards, including codeine and going down to Brownsville. Her performance electrified the audience, earning more high praise from columnist Jim Langdon. While the elevators arrived just in time for their set and left immediately afterward to avoid attracting police attention, Tommy Hall actually caught Janice's performance and was thoroughly impressed. After her set, he invited her to join the band as a second vocalist, recognizing her fiery, soulful singing as a possible great fit for their sound. While flattered, Janice declined. The Aftermath Janice was wary of the Austin scene's temptations, especially given the elevator's open use of LSD. Despite rumors, she never actually sang with the band, focusing instead on her solo career. At the time, she was really cautious about slipping back into the destructive habits she'd escaped in San Francisco. Remember, she was in the midst of a period of sobriety, and a lot of what the elevators signified went completely against that open drug use, sitting on the wrong side of the law, experimenting with new forms of inebriation. In her mind, no was the obvious choice. Here's a quote from Ben Graham, who penned the 2015 book A Gathering of Promises, the battle for Texas's psychedelic music from the 13th floor elevators to the Black Angels and beyond. It seems unlikely that Janice would have considered such a move at this stage anyway. She was still trying to go straight, terrified by the fact that she nearly destroyed herself with drugs in San Francisco. She was wary of the music scene as a whole because of the temptation of drugs, and with the notoriety of their recent bust still hanging over them and their open and continuous use of acid both on stage and off, the 13th floor elevators were surely the last group Janice would have considered joining. Can you imagine Joplin's bluesy wail besides Erickson's garagey screams? That would have been phenomenal. Within a few months, Janice moved back to San Francisco, instead joining Big Brother and the holding company. The elevators themselves would continue down their path with increasing run-ins with law enforcement and ultimately with Rocky Erickson himself being committed to an institution. Opportunities taken or declined set the stage for fascinating futures in music. These are all things I love exploring every single week right here in my album story series, which might actually get a new name soon. Next, dig into a few other Quite interesting things from the catalog of other greatly influential bands from the 1960s, like the 13th Floor Elevators and the Velvet Underground. As people tend to say again and again, this dude is a damn nerd. I'm Andy, this is the Fence Post Vinyl Channel. I'll see you in the next video.